Uh, hi, class. Uh, welcome back. So we are going to finish up chapter 12 and um, it starts chapter six. And that, um, that'll be all that will be covered on the midterm exam. So um, we'll see how far we get. And um, hopefully um, it won't be too much of chapter six, um, but um, chapter six is an important chapter um, to know. But if we don't get to anything, um, it will not be covered. Okay. So let's go over um, the rest of chapter 12. So let's, let's quickly look at this diagram here. So let's go to the slides. Okay. So if we see um, on the slide here, um, you see, last time we talked about covalent bonding, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonding. And um, think of covalent as, you know, equal sharing of the um, electrons in a bond. So when two atoms come together and they form a chemical bond, um, nonpolar covalent, that's um, how we say um, equal sharing. So there's no preference of, of either atom of the bond to hog or to kind of hold on to the electrons towards, um, towards itself. Um, polar covalent is the opposite. You think of polar like, um, like something's, um, maybe something's like very biased or something has like, um, like something, if someone likes something or, or is very passionate or about a subject, you could think of polar that way or like polar caps, like North and South poles. So there are two ends of, you know, of the atmosphere of the earth. Um, so in this case, in polar covalent, we say that one atom has a higher preference for attracting those electrons. So it's gonna it's gonna kind of be unequal sharing. So but still sharing of the electrons because uh, we don't form any ions. And um, last time we talked about ionic bonding right here. So ion ionic bonding is the transfer of el electron or um, electrons. So in a ionic bond, one electron is transferred and you create ions. And that, um, that uh, chemical attraction between the two groups are due to electrostatic forces or a Coulomb's, uh, Coulomb forces. So um, they are due to ions, the formation of positive and negatively charged ions. So they form a pair uh, and, that's, and that's how we get an ionic compound through ionic bonding. Okay, so okay, so next we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about like in polar or non-polar covalent bonds, what um, what kind of property um, allows atoms to kind of have a preference for these electrons? So um, what we what we say is that uh, we're going to talk about something called electronegativity. So electro negativity. So electronegativity is the ability the ability of an atom atom of that element. In a molecule to attract to attract bonding electron bonding electron pairs to itself. So it's not correct to say electrons. Um, because it will not attract lone pairs or other electrons on, um, so let's say, the other atom of the bond. It's always the bonds in the electron. So let's just make that uh, perfectly clear um, so no, there's no confusions to itself. So the electronegativity also gives rise to um, why some molecules are reactive. Um, versus the other. So that's more like a, 
when we talk about let's turn negativity like that, that's more of a uh, organic concept or, or organic chemistry. So, but um, just know that electric negativity, um, it, you will see it um, pop up again and again throughout your um, your chem uh, uh, your chemical or chemistry careers or your journey learning chemistry. So it's an important concept to get down. I would say out of all the periodic trends, um, this one and atomic size is, are the two most important ones, I think, to take away um, from general chemistry. Okay, but anyway, let me just see the time. Just make sure I'm tracking the time. Okay, um, so the trend is greater at the top. Top of any column. Four main group elements. Increases left to right. across any row of the table so you could think like oh this is pretty much the same trend as ionization energy and it's exactly for the same reasons um, one the nuclear charge the increasing nuclear charge of the nucleus for the, um, the element in question and um, the size, the size of the uh, the atom or the atom itself. So in this case, fluorine is the most electronegative element, and that kind of explains why fluorine um, is very uh, as a halogen or as a as an element, it's quite reactive. Um, so fluorine is the most is the most electronegative element. All right, so that is fluorine. Um, let's see. Okay, so that's electronegativity. So now let's kind of go back and see the electronegativity trend on the periodic table. Okay, so here's the periodic table um, and uh, listed are the electronegativity values. So see here, the, the larger the block, the greater the electronegativity. And we see that, um, we see that um, the metals here, they have the lowest electronegativity. So in general metals, they don't want, they don't really participate in covalent bonds. So this makes sense that they do not show electronegativity uh, high electronegativity values. So they're really low right here. As you move across the transition metals, do you, do you get fairly electronegative like right here? And um, 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 that's important when, um, if you ever go into like more advanced classes for inorganic chemistry and study like transition metals uh, specifically, um, that is something that will um, play a role in like reactions and stuff um in that area of chemistry but here we're not too worried about specifically what each kind of transition metal does whereas overall the general trend or um properties of metals non-metals etc so see as we go here non-metals they participate a lot in uh in covalent bonds or in um, um covalent bonding and so they have they will have higher electronegativity values because as we move across the high, we're going to have increasing nuclear charge of the nucleus as we move from left to right and that will that will cause um the atom to want to um, attract those electrons in the bond closer to itself rather than the other less electronegative elements depending on what you have. For example, for in a foreign hydrogen bond, the fluorine is, has an electronegativity value of four, 
So that's the, there's different scales of how they measure um, the, this affinity, but um, here we're just going, we're, we're just concerned with numbers. So four, so much greater than 2.2. So that's a big difference. And that will, that will indicate that fluorine will, will track most of the electrons in the bond in the HF covalent bond. So it's considered a polar covalent bond. And as we go down, the electron activities will decrease because um, the, the nucleus, since it's a larger atom, um, the nucleus won't have much of an effect to attract um, to attract the, uh, the electrons in the bond because remember the bonds are formed from the valence electrons. And since that electron is very far away from the nucleus, um, that uh, remember nuclear, nuclear attraction or um, Coulomb's law, it decreases over distance. Um, remember that R squared term in the denominator that will decrease the attractive force between electrons. Therefore the electronegativity um, has a lower value. Okay, so, but in general, they do increase left to right. There are some exceptions here, right here, see 2.4 and then 1.9, um, and like right here, 2.5. So there are some exceptions, but in general, um, they increase across a period left to right and de uh, decreases down a group. So it's the highest is flooring right here, to the right and, um, and at the top. Okay. So let's talk more about electron activity. Um, so there's so we there's there's also something called electropositivity, um, it, and it's basically the opposite of electronegativity. But I'll I'll, I'll kind of mention it. So electropositivity. So it's basically um, the opposite of electronegativity. So what we say is it, it's the ability of an atom of that element of an element, say it in, in and um, ionic compound, since it's a, since it's not, um, or let's just say in a compound, let's say about that. In a compound to give up um, electron or uh, give up, say, um, elect electron um, or electron uh, electron pairs to another element. So let's just say another atom of a different element. So it's the opposite of electro negativity. Um, and it's mainly uh, mainly for metals. So, um, so things that have very low electronegativity values, um, that means they don't like to attract electrons to themselves, and they're they're electropositive. They like to give up. They, they like to give up electrons to other elements. Um, so they do not have they do not have a strong affinity or attraction to electrons in let's say um, a chemical bond. But um, for the most part, do not worry about electronegativity. The important, the important concept is electronegativity. Um, so do not worry about electropositivity. Um, in fact, um, let's just quickly look. 
Let's just look up the definition of electropositivity. Um, yeah, so um, the definition is the measure of an element's ability to donate electrons and therefore form positive ions. Thus, is opposed to electronegativity. So let's kind of just rework our definition. So the ability of an, you know, atom of that element in a uh, element to let's um so it's not necessarily a compound because metals they don't form um they don't form bond the covalent bonds so let's kind of um lead that so it's the opposite of, of electronegativity okay sorry guys for the sorry um for the um long answer but um after reading that sentence uh, aloud, that quite doesn't, that's quite uh, confusing. So the ability of a, an atom to do, uh, of that element, of an element, the of an, of an atom of an element, element to donate electrons, and uh, form a cation. An element to donate electrons and form um, a let's say let's just say a positive ion, positive ion slash cation because that's the definition of a cation. So in this case, think of electropositivity as how metals lose electrons to form ions. So that's a measure of how easy it is to form ions. So um, all those metals on, to the, uh, on the left here, on the left here, the, um, the first and second columns, they, they form ions very readily. Uh, and most, most of the time transition metals do too, because they have very low electronegativity, but sometimes, you know, they can engage in compounds where um, they are not, they're not necessarily charged. So that is also the case because you know of these 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 values right here, they tend to be a little bit higher compared to these very low ones um, of the other metals. So uh, so these ranges tells you what type of bond you will see um, in in um. Sorry, am I on the? Yeah, let me go back to this desktop. Sorry, I, I realized that I was not. Um, sharing the periodic table. So um, electropositivity, you can think of these two groups right here, the metals. So metals metals in turn are very electropositive because they, um, they do not want to hold on to electrons. They uh, want to give them up. So that is why, um, that is why um, these electrons, they tend to, um, these electrons here, they tend to be lost and form ions. And as you move further to the period, uh, across the periodic table, you get more electronegative elements where they tend to want to, um, remember nonmetals, they tend to want to form negative ions, negative ions. So um, as you move further away and you get more electronegative, the more naturally negative the bonds um, you get, you get more, um, so the difference in the electronegativities of two atoms in the bond, they tell you what type of bond um, you can, you can uh, get. For example, you can get an ionic bond, which has a very big difference in electronegativity, uh, polar covalent and non-polar covalent. So depending on the difference in electronegativity, you can tell whether a bond is non-polar, polar, or polar covalent or ionic. So those are, um, so electronegativity and electropositivity are related to how ad atoms, you know, lose their relative ability to lose electrons and gain electrons um, when they participate in chemical bonding. So the more electronegative element, they will want to gain electrons in the chemical bond. And the more electropositive element over here, they want to lose electrons to form ions predominantly. Uh, so depending on what kind of compound it is, the electronegativity difference will tell you 
what kind of a bond it is. Right, so let me just, prove, that sounds confusing to me, even to me, let me just rephrase that. So depending on the difference in electronegativity of a particular type of bond between two atoms, you can determine the type of bond, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or uh, ionic. Okay, so I think we spent uh, way too much time on this slide, so let's move on. Um, so let's go forward here. Okay. So that was electropositivity. Um, so now we're going to talk about what, what, um, what I was just kind of rambling about. So this will be more clear here. Okay. So the polarity of a bond So the polarity of a bond um, a polarity of a bond can be determined um, by calculating So by calculating the difference between the electro electronegativity values um, for the bonded elements, we can determine um, the polarity of a bond, um, how polar it is. So remember, the most polar a bond can get is the separation of two charges, which is ionic. Um, by calculating the difference, the difference um, between the electro negativity values for bonded elements. Here are some examples. Example, we have HO. So the difference here is Difference. So, um, so I'm going to abbreviate electronegativity as EN. So every time I use EN, um, it's electronegativity. So we have. So don't worry about these values. Don't have to memorize them. But um, this is what um, how you would do it. Three point four minus one point two equal, well, no, it should be 2.2, sorry, that's incorrect. So this slide has a type that I'm looking at, 2.2. So that equals 1.2. So always take the, um, so it should always be a difference, a positive number. So always take the larger number and subtract the, um, the smaller one, 1 1.2. And then we have another example here, HC. So H, um, HC bonds or CH bonds, they're common or in organic molecules. So here's the difference in electronegativity. Um, so we have 2.6 minus 2.2, which is about 0 0.4. So, um, so what can we say about these two types of bonds? Well, we can say that since HO has a higher difference than CH bonds or HC, we say that HO is more polar. More polar than uh, HC as it has a higher, higher electro, um, electro negativity difference. Okay. So we won't, um, so if anything, I'll ask you maybe, um, I'm not sure how I will ask a question about um, polar bonds. I, I might, um, 
I might ask you to classify maybe the type of bonds in the compound, but um, I um, I don't think I would ask you to. Um, I might ask. I might. So it, it might be good to calculate these things, but of course I would give you the values um, to calculate them. So, but you will have to calculate them and maybe classify them. Um, or not classify them, just say which one is more polar than the other. Stuff like, like the like that um, that example we just did. So something like that. You could maybe expect something like that. Okay. So we're going to talk now about multiple bonds. So you know, what is a multiple bond? Well, it just means that there's a stronger type of bond. So um, as you go from the, the hierarchy, single, the double the triple, um, the bond is actually stronger as you go up and it, the bonds are actually shorter because you're, you're sharing more electrons and th those additional attractive forces between the nuclei will kind of contract the atoms closer together. So it's kind of like having an additional um, what's the word? I guess like an, an additional constraint, I guess, or like an additional, um, yeah, an additional, like an additional, um, so uh, like, oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. Um, I'll just say, just think of it like, Like the stronger attractive force, right? The closer you're going to get to something, and the harder it is is going to separate. So as a single bond, you can break it relatively easily, but as you share more electrons, the attractive forces will increase, and you'll feel a stronger attraction. Like um, depending on like if you're worked with magnets or played with like bar magnets, it gets really tough, and uh, you can feel them kind of insane, um, kind of there's such a strong attractive force to the magnets, depending on the strength. And um, it gets really, really tough to separate by your hand. So that's kind of the idea here. The more bonds you have um, indicates more attraction um, in the chemical bond. Okay, but talk about single bond, single bond. So these are formed by sharing, sharing one pair of electrons, one pair of electrons between, between two bonded atoms. And likewise, double bond, you uh, share double bond by sharing two pairs of electrons. And triple bond is by, triple bond is by uh, sharing three pairs of electrons. Um, so in this case, double and triple bonds, they are the multiple bonds. So double and triple. Bonds are the multiple bonds. Bonds in this case, okay. So we, we, um, we do have the instance where we have atoms bonded to more than one atom. So they're not diatomic compounds. They can be triatomic or, or more, three or more atoms. So um, in this case, let's talk about that. So atoms 
responded. One atom. So um, our most maybe prevalent example of this is the formation of a water molecule. Um, so a water molecule, right? So we say that a water, two hydrogen um, atoms are going to combine with an oxygen atom like so. To form a, a water molecule. So you see here that the lone, the two lone pairs on the water, on the oxygen and the hydrogen, they combine and pair with each other to form these two chemical bonds right here. Okay, so that is a triatomic molecule. So that's water. Then we also have um, nitrogen. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. and three are occupied, are, no, sorry, not are occupied, are unpaired, sorry. Are unpaired. So nitrogen tends to bond with three hydrogen atoms. atoms to form an H3. So example of a nitrogen mo uh, molecule is ammonia. Which has nitrogen bonded to um, Bond to three hydrogen atoms. So, so then at this point, nitrogen has a valence of five, so it needs to bond with three other electrons to get um, an octet, and that's why we bond with three hydrogen atoms in this case. Okay. Um, so we're not going to go over exceptions to the octet rule. Um, that. You might see that in the homework, um, but do not worry about, excuse me, do not worry about the exceptions. So um, so for homework sake, um, ju just do them for homework because they were assigned, but um, do not worry about them on the, uh, on the exam. So there are exceptions to the octet rule. Um, so we can, I'll just go over them, but do, they um they are not expected. They will not be tested. So just to give you an example of these compounds um, on Earth, on our on our planet and in the in the world. So so exceptions to the octet rule are odd electron molecules. So basically they are we are we call them radicals. So um so as you can see here, it's impossible to write Lewis diagrams for um, odd electron molecules, which each atom is surrounded by eight valence electrons. That just can't happen. So these are species um, like uh, nitrogen dioxide and nitrous oxide. So, um, so these compounds, we call them radical species because they have they have an unpaired electron, and depending on what kind of what the what the which atom has the lone pair, it kind of dictates its reactivity, and the, you know the lifetime of the radical. So these species, um, these are often I think found in like smoke, like exhaust. 
Um, so the, those, um, they are not, they are not good because um, they, uh, they're radicals. They can be reactive, but this is just an example of odd electron molecules. Um, Okay, never mind. It's not nitrous oxide. I was wrong. So nitrogen monoxide. So it's not not. So this is called nitric oxide. Yeah, so um, these, this is one example. These are two examples of radicals. So this is nitric oxide and um, also called nitrogen monoxide. And also the second one is, yeah, nitrogen oxide. Yeah, um, so we're not going to talk about um, too much about this. So those, those are examples of odd electron uh, molecules. So they are they are they are radicals because they have a free unpaired of electron here, unpaired electron. But do not worry, do not worry about this topic. We're not going to be testing on it. But just um, some information because you know later on Gen Chem you might have to write Lewis structures for these type of molecules. That is fair game. So just the just to kind of uh, preview what kind of uh, molecules to expect. And then we have molecules that exceed the octet rule. Um, for example, phosphorus and sulfur. So elements in the dirt period, they have access to D orbitals. So you can actually extend the valence past, um, past um, four orbitals. So past the S and P orbitals, you can have access to the D orbitals, and that will give you access to bonding more than um, more than uh, eight valence electrons around an element that's in the third um, period and higher, S and P. So more than four electron pairs around the central atom, so more than eight electrons. Okay. Okay, and also there's further exceptions here. Molecules with more than four electron pairs. Um, there's also atoms surrounded by less than um, electron pair, four electron pairs or eight electrons. So these are different from the radical example because they're even numbered of electrons of the whole species. And um, so they can have, so boron here, boron has in its neutral state, three valence electrons, sorry, not three valence electrons, three electron pairs around the, the central atom. And then beryllium, beryllium is in the same group as the um, like magnesium, so the alkaline earth, but it, its properties are very different from those. So it does not have the same properties. It likes to form covalent bonds, so beryllium. Although alkaline earth metal it likes to form covalent bonds here. So beryllium surrounded by two, um, boron surrounded by um, three, um, three electron pairs. Okay, oxygen is another one. Um, and it's because oxygen has two different states. So it has a singlet state and um, a triplet state. So the triplet state. Um, we're not going to get too much into it, but one, one, one is a radical. So if you look up oxygen on, on, uh, Wikipedia or something, you'll see, um, it depicts it as its triplet state. Cause that's the ground state of oxygen. So the triplet, a triplet means it has, it has, um, it has, a it has an unpaired electron. So it has a, it has a, uh, it has, um, so a triplet, a triplet means it has two unpaired, uh, two unpaired electrons. So, um, so oxygen, we know oxygen in nature is not just the oxygen atom, it's O2. So oxygen in the atmosphere is O2 gas. 
So it has an oxygen atom has one oxygen atom has a rat unpaired electron bonded to another oxygen atom with another unpaired electron. So that that gives rise to the um, the triplet nature of oxygen. The singlet nature is where we have oxygen. That's commonly known as the double bonded form of oxygen. Oxygen with a double bond to another oxygen atom, that's a singlet state. But that, that oxygen atom is very, very reactive. And it's not, it's not rarely encountered. You can generate it synthetically, but it's, um, one, it's very reactive. And two, if that was the oxygen, like around us now, it it will be destructive towards um, towards living organisms. Uh, it's very reactive. It oxidizes things rapidly, without without any um, activation. So it's very reactive and um, it's it's very short lived. So that's kind of like maybe like a little history lesson about about oxygen. But um, oxygen. Because of its dual nature like that, it's impossible to write a single Lewis diagram that explains the property of molecular oxygen, which is O2. Okay. Okay, guys, a few more slides here and then we'll head on to chapter six. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about metallic bonds. So let's go back. So for the um, the expanded uh, so the exceptions to the octet rule do not worry about the what the two slides I just mentioned do not worry about them too much, but just be aware about about them because in general chemistry you will go more into that, um, in the, when you take uh, chem two a so you, this things will be encountered again but th this time um, for our class we're not going to test them so do not worry about that. Okay, so let's talk about metallic bonds. Metallic bonds, okay. So when we talk about metal, metal bonds, so like, you know, when you have a piece of metal like copper, like it's pure copper, it's not like ions or anything. So how do we explain, um, how do we explain the bonding if there's no, if there's no like negative anion present to form a solid, um, for form a strong solid of the metal. And um, so we need there, we need to kind of have a model to, to describe this type of bond. So what we say is that there's an attractive force. Attractive force between positively positively charged metal ions ions in a crystal so these these um, these atoms are arranged in a crystal structure and the negative And the negatively, negatively charged, negatively charged electrons that move along them. Okay, so let me backtrack. So in the metals, there's going to be. Um, instances of um, ions forming. So the metal ions, so they tend to be positively charged, right? So it would make sense if those the, the metals can be combined, bonded to each other because they're both cations, that would make sense. So um, in our, our model, we say that the electrons that are among both metal atoms, they, um, they influence the, the other, they influence bonding between two, two, two positively, excuse me, two positively charged metal ions. So we say that uh, kind of like um, we have a metal ion, metal, metal cation that are surrounded by a sea, sea of electrons that kind of explain the bonding between two metal, 
between two metal atoms or metal ions. So we say that the electrons in a metallic bond, they're delocalized. So they're not, they're not centralized in like a physical bond, like a bond in like a bonding space or in a bonding area, like in the covalent bond. So it's not, it's not the, um, so we're not really talking about the valence electrons per se. We're talking about maybe all the electrons that, that are part of the metal atom. Because, you know, metals, they tend to have, um, they tend to want to lose electrons readily. So um, one, so in the case for metal-metal bonding, they'll lose their electrons. And uh, electrons in metallic bond, they're going to be um, delocalized because there's electrons among them that account for the bonding, that attractive force. And when we say those electrons are not, you know, they're not kind of localized, they're, they're not like set in a place for bonding, like a distinct bond in a particular place, we call them delocalized. And these delocal, delocalized electrons, they give the properties of metals, for example, electro, electrical conductivity, um, charge transfer, uh, char, transfer of charge, electrical charge. So that, that's one of the features of having metals and delocalized electrons. So, um, so, so let's, let's talk about, um, let's so just talk about, let's kind of break that thing down. What are delocalized electrons? If these, there are electrons between these two atoms, what does delocalize mean, right? Um, so electrons, electrons in the metallic bond, are delocalized. So the model I like to visualize them as is kind of these, um, the, model, uh, the model I like to use is called the, um, Okay, so we're gonna talk about the model I like to use in the next slide, but it's like the sea of electrons. That electrons are kind of interspersed between the metal ions, the electrons. So that counts for the attractive force. But you see um, what, what I mean when I say delocalized, you'll see in, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay, so electrons in the metallic bond are delocalized electrons. So let's define that term. So you'll hear this term a lot, um, especially when, when we start talking about resonance structures, you'll start hearing about that. Um, it basically means that electrons are not, they're not particular to one type of bond. They can be moved around to different parts of the molecule because they are not restricted, to, um, say a single covalent bond. Um, and usually the localized electrons, they, are, they come in the pair, uh, form of, in this case, other electrons in the atom, so maybe lone pairs, um, maybe um, electrons from a different different bond, like a double or triple bond, for example. But the localized electrons, they, they mean they 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 don't have to be located in one place. So the electrons, electrons in the molecule, molecule not restricted. not restricted to remaining near, near a single atom atom or between two atoms in a covalent bond. So, so that was the example I, uh, so that's, that's a breakdown of what I just said. So electrons in the molecule, so they don't have to be, they don't have to be confined to stay near a, an atom or 
um, between two atoms in a covalent bond. So they're, 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 uh, they're likely to move to different parts of the compound or molecule. And in this case, a metallic bond, they're going to be spread out everywhere amongst the metal ions. So next we talk about alloys. So alloys is just a mixture of two different elements that has um, bulk metallic properties. So alloy. So alloys are usually a mixture of a two, it could be two metals or a metal and a, um, it could be a mixture of a metal and a non-metal too. Um, so it's a solid mixture. So a solid mixture of two or, metal, of two or more elements. In this case, the elements, they have to be different. That has macroscopic, So macroscopic meaning they have properties um, of, of the metals that we see. They're good conductors. They absorb heat uh, readily, conduct heat and electricity, stuff like that, brittle, uh, well, not brittle, uh, malleable. Um, they're malleable, ductile, um, may have luster. Um, so, so, so both like macroscopic and metallic properties that we can actually observe. Okay. Okay, so now let's go um, to this slide right here. So this explains the electron C model of a metallic crystal or, uh, or what happens, um, how metal, um, we have metal metal bonding for like pure, like copper, like stuff where we don't have another anion to have a, a strong ionic solid. So these are our examples of metallic, uh, metallic um, solids and the metallic crystals and the arrangement of atoms. So let's see here, the metal ions, they're, they're formed in a sea of electrons that combine them. So, um, so think of it this way. Um, so how do we form ions if the electrons aren't going anywhere, right? They're not being transferred to a non-metal. You could think of it this way, our copper atom, approaches say another copper metal atom you know they're both neutral right but um once the atom approaches another atom it's going to attract the electrons um between the two so it, it creates an attractive force but um we, we don't say it it forms a bond like a covalent bond or something like that or like a, a ionic bond um because um, because metals, they don't tend to attract electrons themselves, right? Um, they're, they're fairly uh, electropositive, so they like to form um, cations and lose electrons. So, so the takeaway is that metal, in the presence of other metal atoms, they'll form positively charged um, metal ions because of the presence of other metal atoms. And those electrons that get kind of redistributed uh, when they approach each other in like a solid structure, a tightly knit solid structure here, the electrons associated amongst the, uh, amongst the um, metal ions, the uh, electrons part of those atoms will constitute the attractive force present in a metallic crystal or metallic solid. I see here we have mon, mon, atom, um, uh, ions with uh, one charge. And then we have also for ions with two charge, see the, they'll attract more electrons, stronger attractive forces between the, um, between, uh, between um, the metal, between the metal structure here, the metal metal bond here because of the, the stronger charge, the higher charge of the cation will promote more electrons to be associated between, between each of those ions, um, strengthening the attractive force. Okay, so that's the electron C model. So basically these metal atoms are the boats 
and these electrons are present in, in the space of where these ions occupy and that, that strengthens the material and creates uh, metallic metallic bonding because of these attractive forces between these metal cations and the electrons that are amongst um, amongst the elements present in in the solid here. Okay, so let's move on. So let's um, so we talked about alloys, right? So let's talk about some of the common types. So that will be the last slide for this chapter. Okay, so we have 18 karat gold, composition of gold, silver, copper, brass, copper and zinc, bronze, copper and tin, uh, brass, yeah, copper and zinc, tin. Don't, don't worry, I probably wouldn't, I will not test this. This is just some common alloys. Um, I won't test you like to know the exact composition, not like that. Carbon steel, you can you can actually reinforce an alloy with, with, with metal properties with carbon and iron. So that's iron, pewter, tin, antimony, copper, stainless steel. So stainless steel, like stuff you see maybe on your fridge or maybe your household, they're mostly iron. And then um, they have some other elements that reinforce it, like chromium, nickel, and may have um, many other small quantities of other elements. And then silver, uh, sterling silver, it's not all silver. It has a mixture of silver and copper. Okay, so the guys, that's chapter 12. Um, and yeah, we only have almost, we have about a little bit over 20 minutes left. So we'll start chapter six. So let's go back here. So we're gonna start on chapter six, so let me just open that chapter. Okay, that's chapter 12. So the main takeaways for chapter 12 are the chemical bonding, electronegativity, activity, poor, non-poor, and ionic bonds, and how to identify them. Okay, uh, so let's go to, so now we're going to talk about nomenclature. So that's chapter six. So uh, like, oh, uh, the many names of these compounds you see online I mean, in the real world, they have names. Uh, there's so many of these compounds, we need systematic names. So this is a very important chapter. Okay. Um, okay, let's see here. All right. So the first thing we have to know about Naming is what um, the chemical formula. So to name a compound, we need to know the chemical formula. So let's, so this is chapter six. So we're gonna talk about chemical nomenclature. So we're gonna talk first about chemical formulas. So we, we, I think we talked about this briefly in chapter two, but we're now we're gonna go into more detail. Okay, so chemical formula, they are used to represent, represent the particles of an element. or compound in written form. So every time you take a chemistry class, you always see chemical reactions represented by chemical formulas. So um, the, the species that take part in the chemical form, a uh, chemical reaction are always represented by chemical formulas. Because how else can we communicate what, what we're talking about if we don't have a notation that's easily recognizable by everyone studying chemistry worldwide. So, so it does include symbols, includes symbols of the elements of a substance.
And it also includes subscript number. Subscript number. So the subscript denotes the number of types of atoms. So it denotes the number, denotes the number of atoms of an element of an element in a formula unit. So for example, Formula unit, we're, uh, just uh, it's just the um, the chemical formula of a compound. For example, one formula unit will be like water, two hydrogens, and one oxygens, like that. For example, right here. So, but we do omit the subscript. A uh, single atom is present. So. We do not write water as H2O1. That is, that is, um, that's tedious to put the one. One is always assumed because you can't have zero. You can't write oxygen and you have zero oxygen molecules, right? So when the subscript is one, it is implied and it's not explicitly written. So when we only have one, one um, particular atom, we just put the atom symbol and that's it. So just know that when it's not, when, when we're just talking about one of anything, one water molecule in a chemical formula, you'll never put one H2O, you just put H2O for single water molecules. Just know that anything that has one implied in the subscript or in the coefficient of a chemical reaction, uh, it's implied and it will not have one explicitly written. Okay, so subscript. Is omitted. When a single atom atom is present. So here are some examples. So we have H2O. So the subscript denotes two hydrogen atom, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom composed of water molecule. So the, that whole structure of oxygen and two, oxygen, uh, two hydrogen atoms is the water molecule. And see, for water, we do not write, um, we do not, we do not, we do not write um, one, as a subscript for the oxygen. So we just keep it as just oxygen. And now we have sodium chloride, um, NaCl. So one sodium to one chloride atom. In this case, it's an ion, but um, it, um, they, um, they form ions and it's in the one to one ratio. Okay, so, so this is an example of a chemical formula. We, we've probably seen this um, a lot already, but this is just um, reinforcing that. Okay. So now let's talk about formulas of elements. So, um, so what about a majority of the elements? Like in the natural, under natural form, what, what are their formulas, right? So how do, what do they exist as? Do they exist as the elements, single elements listed on periodic table or do they, do, or do they exist as something else? So a majority of them do, majority of the elements exist as single atom particles so the elemental symbol 
Elemental symbol, formula, formula that reflects, formula that reflects that the uh, basic unit, basic unit, unit is an un is an uncombined uncombined atom so the majority of them are um single atom particles so most of the elements um their formulas are just a, their elemental symbol on the periodic table for example we have So even though we talked about metallic metallic bonding, it's still it's still represented by the atom itself. And um, as a whole, you will only see like a bulk of one atom. So usually metals and the noble gases, they're usually composed of single atom particles. So just the atom of the uh, just the symbol of the element on the periodic table itself. So for example, helium. Helium. That's the that's the formula for the element of helium in uh, in how it exists. And um, lithium, for example, metals. So usually all metals metals the, to the left of the periodic table, the transition metals. They usually they will exist as gesture elemental symbol. Um, uh, elemental symbol and a single atom particle. So if I say copper, you would just say, what's the formula for the element copper? You just say copper. Um, now, if it's, uh, if it's an ionic compound, that's okay. So this is just for elements, not compounds um, or molecules. So, me so basically metals, noble gases, stuff like that. Um, for non-metals, a, a little bit different. We'll talk about that. So there's also things called diatomic um, molecules. So these are two atom molecules. And the prefix di means two, so two atom molecules. So for example, compounds like HH, the um, covalent bond between two hydrogen atoms, that's considered a diatomic molecule, HF. So it says any, um, any, any molecule that has only two atoms that um, comprise it. Okay, uh, so that's diatomic molecules. So let's, let's take a look at the diatomic molecules. So the elements that, the elements that exist as stable diatomic molecules are, Stable diatomic molecules. So they are H2. So there, I think there's seven of them. N2, O2, F2, CO2, Br2, and I2. So, um, so, L, so these these are just elements. Um, we don't we we don't list we don't list the other molecules that are composed of two different atoms because they're no longer elements um, because they have more than one one element composed of them. So, these are just a single element type that exists as stable diatomic molecules. So, matter H two H two gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, the halogens. So those are the, yeah, the seven, the seven stable diatomic molecules. So these are really important to know in terms of like when we say, if, when we just start talking about reactions, I'll be like, I'll be like, like um, like I react propane and oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. A combustion reaction, for example, for stuff stuff like you know where you maybe in your barbecue. 
So say I, I do that. Well, if I just say, if someone wrote, wrote me the chemical form for propane and just wrote the auction at them, that is wrong because auction does not exist as a monatomic elemental atom, single atom. It exists as O2 right here. Uh, did I not share that? Oh, I did not share it. Sorry. Oh, wait, I, um, oh, no, no. I wrote it down. Okay. So you see here on auction, well, I'll just show you um, the slide I'm looking at. So these are all the elements that exist at the atomic uh, molecules. So, um, so you need to um, be aware when we when we're talking about chemical reactions, we're talking about the elements in their stable form. So metals will always be the single atom uh, elements. So just like bromine, uh, not bromine, barium, one barium atom. Um, copper, one copper atom, one silver, one silver atom, AG, just your symbol. But when we talk about the stable diatomic elements, the, the elements as diatomic molecules, when we say hydrogen, you have to put H2. You can't just put one H. Unless we say hydrogen atom, then you could put hydrogen, just one hydrogen. There's a symbol. But when we say hydrogen, like hydrogen gas or just hydrogen without the gas, that's talking about these elements as the stable diatomic molecules. So I, I, I'm going to reiterate this because when I taught reactions last year, law students made that mistake and it was wrong. So whenever you're talking about these molecules, like in in um, in the world as they exist, you must talk about their stable forms. So stable diatomic molecules: nitrogen, oxygen. Boring, chlorine, bromine, ionine. Of course, you can produce the atoms um, in, in experiments, but usually, um, usually, um, um, when we talk about chemical reactions, um, unless it's specified that way, um, do not assume that that the natural form of hydrogen, nitrogen, and all these elements are the single single atom uh, formula. It's always these diatomic molecules. So H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. Because um, these exist, fluorine, all these exist as gases. Bromine's a liquid, iodine's a solid. So they do exist, but they do not exist as a single atom. They exist as a diatomic atom. Okay, so those are the elements that uh, we kind of expect. Uh, as stable diatomic molecules. So now let's go over. Um, so let's go over our active exercise. So I'm going to pull up this active exercise. Um, I'm just going to write it. Okay. There we go. All right. So now we're talking about, let's do our our active exercise for today. So this exercise, I want you to write the chemical formulas. So most likely if I do put stuff on the exam, exam on Thursday, it'll probably be stuff like this. Um, so stuff we have gone over. So don't, I won't put on a midterm, practice midterm, you might see like a table with like naming stuff. Um, but uh, don't uh, I, I won't expect you guys to know that because I don't expect us to go through um, the complete naming of ionic and molecular compounds yet. So um, I would not worry about too much about that. So just worry about like saying, writing the formulas for elements, the, diatom the elements as diatomic molecules, stuff like that. So write the chemical formulas of chlorine, argon, bromine, and krypton. OK, so to do this exercise, so remember that we went over that majority of the elements, they exist as single atom, uh, single atom particles. So for the ones that weren't on the previous slide, we can just write them as single atom formulas. So for example, argon, 
So argon would be AR, and then krypton is KR. All right, so krypton is also, it's also a noble gas, so it has a single atom particle. Okay, so next we have chlorine and bromine. Remember, chlorine and bromine are were one of those two, one of the, di, they're part of the diatomic elements as stable diatomic molecules. So we, we write them as their diatomic forms. So we have chlorine and bromine. Cl2, Br2. So, um, so also thing that when you're writing these formulas, remember to capitalize the first letter always. So don't write lowercase br, b then r. Um, I don't know that kind that that kind of. I don't know why, but kind of kind of bugs me. I don't know why it bugs me, but I, it's just not correct. Is what I'm saying. I mean, I won't take points off now because you you gotta just learn chemistry. But that's just that's just something I saw as common mistakes. But I don't think I would go as far as to um, take points off for, for that, as long as you had B and R in the form, in the, in the, in the formula. But um, just, just something to keep in mind, um, like I, I'm not one for kind of quirks about learning chemistry, but just remember, just always capitalize the first letter. Uh, because you start, Start writing symbols that do that are not capitalized. People will not understand what you're talking about, or they'll 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 probably figure out what you're trying to say, but it won't be correct, and it can cause misunderstandings. So just make sure you um write them how as I taught you, because that's the right way to do it. So always capitalize the first letter. So but a lot some students in my house classes they would lowercase the C and CL, B and BR. Stuff like that. Okay, let's see how much time I have left. Oh, okay, we have two minutes. So, see our solution, chlorine two, like that. Okay. So argon. So here's argon. Krypton. Chlorine. And bromine. Okay. So hopefully that was okay. Okay, let's move on now. Okay. So let's let's just so as a reminder, we went over metals and non-metals, right? Look at this periodic table, the stair step line, these are semi-metals, so they have properties of both non-metals and metals. So we went over um, that last time. Okay, so um, I do not want to go. So the next part, uh, we're talk talking about nomenclature, but I do not want to talk about it because we're not going to be able to cover cover it completely. So I think we'll stop here. So uh, reminder, um, guys, that um, that um, reminder. So for the takeaway, so. So we, we, we re, we're we revisiting this slide because um, we're going to now talk about naming compounds. So we have metals here, non-metals, and metal metal away. So um, they're, they're, they'll have certain naming conventions if you have a metal and a non-metal or a non-metal and another non-metal. So there'll be different naming conventions. So that's why we're re revisiting the classifications here. So, um, Anyway, so I think we'll end there. So things to kind of review from this chapter are like just chemical formulas, um, writing formulas of elements, and that's basically it, knowing what the subscript is and that when we write subscripts for like sodium chloride to have one atom, we do not write the subscript. So if you do write the subscript, um, Don't, don't write the subscript. I will I will mark you down for that. Do, do not write the subscript. That is not necessary. Um, so I'm just getting you the habit of not doing that because um, it's not necessary and it will it will look it will look it will look uh, strange. Um, seeing seeing you represented that way. So don't so don't do that. Um, so anyway, things to note: the homework 
is due on Thursday for chapter 12, so previous chapter. So make sure you do that. It'll be a great review for the midterm. So don't put that off. And you don't want to kind of put that off after the midterm because I, I just don't think it'll be a good feeling to have to do the homework after you just taken a big exam. Um, anyway, um, so I'm going to, so up to what we covered in chapter, uh, chapter six, that is what um, you can expect. It might be tested, it might not, but you, you can't, um, you can't, um, you can't take that risk of ignoring it. So I would just review up to what we have covered. And um, I think it's pretty, I think um, it, it, if it's not straightforward, let me know and we, we I can help you. So if you need help, I don't have office hours until Friday. So if you need, if you have any questions, email me or ask on Piazza or, or uh, stuff like that. And I will answer them right away. Um, so the midterm, I would be posting an announcement um, I already created an assignment for the midterm. So, um, so some, some things, you know, it'll be this Thursday. So I, I've announced that, um, multiple times in the past, um, in the past, like a few weeks, um, prior to the first quiz, I announced that the midterm will most likely be pushed down to, to this Thursday. So it'll be on, I posted the chapter topics on, in the announcements, so look at the announcements again for the topics list. But it's basically every chapter we covered so far, um, up to chapter six of the material we covered today. And um, this format will be very similar to the quiz. You're going to you're going to either print it out. I'm going to either you're going to print it out, or you can work on it on a, like a tablet, or you can use um, scratch paper, blank pieces of paper. So those of you using blank pieces of paper, I'm going to create a template for you to write your answers. Um, so you can use that. You can use that um, ahead of time to to format to format your own piece of the paper. So you don't have to do it on the day exam. So you don't have to like kind of format um, your answers. So I think that'll be more helpful. So it'll just be a list of numbers, um, and maybe. Uh, parts of the other exam and that that's formatted. So it'll just have, it'll just have a format of, uh, of maybe how you want to write the, um, your answers or how you list them based by section. So you don't have to do that uh, ahead of, uh, on the exam because that will take some time too. So I'll, I'll do that for, um, I'll provide that and people who want to do that, you're allowed to copy a copy down the template on your pieces of the paper before the exam. So that that's okay. Um, you're also allowed a three by five inch index card. You can use it, write anything you want. Um, you'll be provided a periodic table and an equation sheet that was um, provided on, on the, um, the quiz. So you're able to use that. Um, I probably I'll probably will not change the equation sheet. I mean, any any of those equi any of the conversions are fair game. So um, yeah, that's I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, any questions? Just let me know. Email me. Post on Piazza. But anyway, guys. Anyway, uh, class, that is it. And I will if there if I don't, and I'll see you on Thursday for the exam. All right. See ya.